I'm, I'm deep in my heart an adversarial person. This is <laughs> this is recorded. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for showing <laughs> thanks for showing me the nice side then for 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 at least up until now. Um, okay, so let's the uh, final push for for today. Um, look at uh, generative adversarial networks or GANs, uh, how they are called. Um, and um, yeah, I hope everything that came so far is going to set us up to understand them in a, in a kind of a common way, but also maybe a few things are going to be controversial. So I'm really up for, for a nice debate here with you. Okay. Um, By the way, I should have mentioned, really Wu Chen got me sort of interested. Okay. This is on him. Okay, great. Um, and we still don't know if Wu Chen actually is here or not here. That's what, what you always know in, with, with Zoom. Um, like I know a few people are here, but Wu Chen I haven't seen today. So if he wants to out himself, he can, uh, that will be really fun. Uh, okay, great. So let's go into guns. Um, and um, look again, big picture, what we are trying to do. Um, we're trying to... Um, generate samples so we're pushing forward z to some distribution that hopefully looks similar to x or hopefully identical and in order to train and learn the weights for our generator what we need to do is we need to have some way of comparing these distributions and in the gan um so the gan so far we have actually avoided really comparing these distributions i would say because we always had, in some sense, a notion of cor correspondences between data points and latent points that we could use to somehow quantify or, or at least estimate the likelihood of a sample. So that now is um, off the table because of some of the limitations we have seen. Um, we want to avoid this. And uh, the problem we are then opening up is how to compare these distributions. Um, and that is really the tricky part. So you can say GAN is a likelihood free um, algorithm. Um, and that means that we will not use the likelihood of the samples or approximate it during the training. Doesn't mean that in the end of the day, you cannot estimate the likelihood, but you're not using it to train. Um, you avoid the correspondence problem altogether. You don't care which Z is related to which X. And you sample directly from the latent distribution in the training, which is different from both CNF and VAE, because also in the CNF, you only sampled from the data distribution. And um, I showed you the, that's why I showed you this plot where I took the inverse of the, of the data samples and they looked sort of Gaussian with a little bit of a ridge in between. But that means that if you sample on the ridge, then who knows what, what's going to happen. And again, you sample directly from the latent distribution. So that's a sales pitch. Um, and now I want to take a little bit apart of what the implications are, because there are a few places where you're actually paying for this uh, for these choices. Um, so how do you compare these things? I don't think anyone or any of us can write down uh, a loss function that is uh, that everyone in the room would agree to. So the idea again is uh, let's uh, use a second neural network in here. And the second neural network, we will call the discriminator, um, is used to train the, to measure the distance. Um, two options. So the first one is a simple idea, uh, standard GAN um, framework, treats this as a two sample test problem and uses binary classification. So whether basically the, the discriminator tries to find out if an image was real or fake. Um, that's the idea. And the other one is uh, maybe we can measure the transport cost between the dis different distributions. So that's then what's called Wasserstein GAN and a totally different area. So we're going to touch touch a little bit on both of them, discuss them a bit, show you some like, some results, and then sum up the course. That's 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 the plan of the game. Okay, so. How do you do this with binary classification really just a quick idea um, let's call this uh, discriminator D5. Um, it's a mapping that takes uh, an, an image, an, an RN, or better like shaped as a 2D image, um, uh, as we discussed, and gives a probability um, that is a 1 if it's a real image and 0 if it's a fake image. It's really just a classification problem. Um, and um, then you can write down basically the loss. So it's a cross-entropy loss for a classifier um, that you can come up with. 
Um, and uh, this is now a function in theta and phi, which are the weights of the generator and the discriminator. Um, here you sample a bunch of images from the data set and you compute um, that, that term. And to compute the other term, you really sample from the prior. Okay, so now you can look at this in two ways. So the generator wants to confuse the discriminator and the discriminator, of course, wants to be on top of things and find out if a sample was real or not real. So it's a, now they are not playing on the same team anymore, which means that you are in for solving a set of point problem or finding a Nash equilibrium. In other words, you want to find um, a, a tuple, uh, theta star, phi star, so that no one player can uniformly improve without putting the other player worse off. Okay, so that's um, mathematically, I think, an intriguing uh, ballpark of problems um, to, to solve, especially when you now realize that this is also a stochastic settle point problem because you have expected values all around. Uh, this is becoming really, really interesting. Um, and uh, so that, what do you do in practice? Um, I mean, at some point we have to look at solving a problem. Um, you are going to do the following. You use stochastic approximation, of course. So basically Monte Carlo applied to these two things with mini batches. And then you alternate between updating the phi and the theta. Um, I don't know how much experience you guys have with settle point problems. So typically when, uh, when I teach optimization, um, I give like a standard example with a um, quadratic function that um, you know, is, has an um, indefinite Hessian and try to look for a stationary point and doing alternating minimization there can become already quite tricky because it means that you need to choose the step size really carefully in order to not diverge the whole iteration. Because if one, basically this means that if one player, so to say, is too powerful, then it will completely kill the other guy. But, but yeah, that's uh, last, but can't you, is, is, aren't people using all that framework about primal dual splitting schemes? using in particular things like proximal mappings that are non-expansive, yeah. sort of control this process. Is yeah, you absolutely. Um, you, there are tons of, that's what I said, you know, mathematically is a really interesting yeah. area of, of, of um, research and, and, and uh, you know, testing out algorithms. Um, there are more advanced methods than alternating minimization, for sure. There are variation inequality, I think, is currently the, the state of the art um, uh, in, in that area. But um, still, I would say it's a very popular approach okay. to do this in an alternating fashion. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, so far from being perfect um, that um, you know, you, you'll see if you actually want to train a gun, uh, you need uh, you need good patience here okay. because even for like say deterministic quadratic problem doing uh, alternating gradient updates can become quite tricky um, and here now everything is also stochastic noisy and so on um, and that is a big difference i see when you go from normalizing flow vaes to the gan world where the optimization we swept the optimization under the rug i mean i know albert asked me about what what do you use to optimize the normalizing flow Probably my answer could have been use whatever you have, but uh, can make them all work. Here now it's becoming really about the details and also about the balance. You want uh, one of, you don't want one of them to become too powerful right away. That's right. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that's where we are. What what fight we are in for? A few, um, yeah, a few reminders. So solving a cellophane problem ain't so easy. Um, let's. Uh, no, let's dream a little bit. Let's uh, say we have the weights of the optimal classes of the optimal generator. So you you found it magically. I gave it to you. By the way, um, one thing I found actually quite to be quite effective is to use a VAE to train the generator uh, before using a gun. So think about. I mean, I mean, they are all trying to solve the same problem. Uh, some of them seem to be a little bit easier to deal with, maybe suboptimal in the results, but that doesn't mean that you cannot combine them. Um, but you get a good, do you get a good initial guess? Yeah, I get, a, I get a great initial guess. I mean, you saw my images. I mean, they may be a little bit too smooth, yeah, but, um, but they look like they look like digits. It's not that, um, and it didn't take me almost any effort to get there. 
Um, those of you who've ran the notebook or will run the notebook, you'll see it's like five minutes of your day or 10 minutes of your day to run it. Um, and you can probably change most of the hyperparameters and still get to the same place. Um, so anyway, let's say we have theta star. We are we have the dream set of weights, um, the exact match between G of Z and X. Um, will never happen, but let's, let's say we, we are there. What would happen to the discriminator? What, what would the optimal discriminator do? Does anyone have a guess, by the way? Maybe that's a good, um, good uh, spot to make this somewhat interactive. Well, to me, the discriminator is a peak function. Uh, so if I gave you, yeah. So so let's be a bit concrete here. So if I so the discriminator takes a sample from X, yes. what value do you think it should uh, it should give me? It's a number between zero and one because it's a probability of uh, being okay, part yeah, of the true right. data. Right. So if the distributions truly are the same. I would argue that the discriminator should give you one half. Because you know there is no difference statistically between X and Z. Um, and uh, so the only legit answer I, I see is uh, to give 50%. Uh, it's basically a coin toss for anything you feed into this. I, I frankly, I'm not sure about this. Um, okay, so let's say it's, it's not. So let's say well, there is you have, a, you, you have an explicit um, you have an explicit objective in this case. You can probably compute can probably compute the optimal solution, can't you? Exactly. So so P, uh, Peter, um, let's go back to the so this was the objective function here. Yeah, yeah. I see. Um, and so say they are really the same things. So then I can combine the expected values, correct? And you can that compute the, the minimum to be at, uh, you know, the D has to be one half then. Yes, I, the I understand that. But the thing is that uh, you, you can design the things not to exactly discriminate in the half and then kind of gain something from this based on okay. uh, the process. I'm, I'm just generalizing a little. Okay, yeah, if you, yes, in general, I mean, again, we look at the very specific case where you have the yeah. optimal generator and you have the optimal discriminator. Yeah. So that's, that's you know, the, the dream come true, um, which won't be happening for three reasons, actually. Yeah, I'll show you. So what, what, would, the, what would this really mean? Um, so basically, you have this one half, um, and that would be a settle point, okay? Uh, that will be your settle point or you, your Nash equilibrium. Two remarks, or three, uh, you have that um, these are both parameters by a DNN. So chances are that you won't find um, really the, the true, I mean, the true parameters, the optimal parameter may not be the one that really matches the distribution perfectly because you have an error with the parameterization. Um, and you need the expressiveness and the weights to come together to do this. So it's kind of hard to predict if you can get there or not. But what's more important is that, like any settle point, um, you will not find a stable settle point. I think the book, the book on stable settle points, has never been a bestseller on Amazon. Um, so what that means is that if you have a tiny screw up, so say you have those great weights and you perturb them slightly with a very small, um, small update, and you compute the optimal discriminator in whatever way possible, then you will have um, a, a completely, I mean, you will have really harsh discriminator in here. And what would also happen uh, is that the discriminator kind of has an incentive to be piecewise constant almost. So on the true data and on the fake data, you would have a, like a maximal, like a zero or one. That's basically what the optimal discriminator would do. There's not much room in between really when there's a, there's a mismatch. Um, and in that case, you may argue that the gradient of the GAN function with respect to theta, which is the generator weight. So the generator is off. You want to improve the generator. But when the discriminator completely gives you almost no signal, then the gradient will be zero. Um, so that is something you have to anticipate happening here. Um, and um, it's, it's one 
problem. I, I mean, there are some heuristics, I think, how to reformulate the problem to get rid of this limitation, but it's not going to change the fact that you are looking for a settle point and a settle, settle point uh, can behave very in a very unstable fashion. But, but Lars, a yeah. settle point generally is a critical point. I is mean, a critical point? Yeah. It is a critical point, so the gradient should be zero. Actually, it's the gradient of the Lagrangian should be zero. Yeah, yeah, sure, but, but that's Wolfgang, not the Lagrangian. Yeah. But but this this point here is not a stationary point. It's, really. it's, it's not a Lagrangian. This is yeah, yeah, it's not a stationary point because you have. Oh, well, I have perturbed the theta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want yeah, to but get if, a signal to are, get back. If, if things are continuous, I mean, it should be close. Nevertheless, yeah. because if, if you are close to a, to a stationary point, you 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 should have a small grid. That is true. That is true. Um, I thought that would be desirable. Um, I agree. Like um, that's the same discussion we have in, in deep, deep network with vanishing gradients. So vanishing gradient from an optimization per perspective means great. I've done my job. I can go home. Yeah. But um, the the difficulty here, Wolfgang, is that you are at a place where the generator the generator is not good in the sense that it or it's not perfect. So you optimal, mean it could vanish for other reasons? <laughs> yes, it, it vanishes for the wrong reasons. Um, because the generator right now is not perfect. I mean, there is a mismatch between um, the push forward of Z and the data distribution. And the goal in learning is to find out how to make up for that difference by improving the generator. And the way to do this is gradient-based optimization, but I'm getting no signal from my loss function because I have this crazy way of computing the loss function with this discriminator. And that can be too powerful. So that's a, that's the a crux. So you are, yes, you're you are, you are happy because you may have found a new stationary point, your gradient is zero, but you're not happy because your images don't look great. Mm -hmm. And you want to have some signal to improve that. Mm -hmm. So again, but again, like a, a little bit of a simpler debate, but also the uh, same, uh, uh, yeah, as hilarious is this discussion on vanishing gradients in, in DNN training. Because the vanishing gradient for optimizers means we can go home. And for neural network persons, it's not, not the case. Um, okay, so that is one thing that could go wrong here in, in the training. And there is one other thing also. Um, yeah, there's actually you know, some theory and uh, how you can look into this in a more rigorous way. I only wanted to give you like a, a quick spiel of this. The other one is um, called mode collapse. I don't know if you heard about this term ever. It's, uh, it's, it's one of these funny terms that are floating around in machine learning. So let's look at the following scenario. I have my generator and it maps almost all Z to the first data point. Hmm. How do you like this generator, by the way? Well, Gabe doesn't like it very much. So it's not a, not a, not a really good generator. No. Um, so again, we would want to have a gradient that would be useful to help us improve this generator. What would the optimal discriminator do in this case? I think uh, if you feed in all the data points, so for, um, for x1, it would be confused. Because x, I think for x1, it could come from the... Um, uh, from, from the true distribution, or it could come from, from the other distribution. Since there are more points there, probably it should assign zero because then you screw up only one point. And for all the other ones, there's no problem. It would easily figure out they are from the real distributions. Okay, so again, you have this piecewise constant uh, classification um, part. And which, which actually, if you look at then the loss function, it uh, would look probably pretty good. Because um, the I mean, you basically you screw up only uh, only on one of these points. So it's um, um, yeah, it's uh, it is arguably a, a constructed example, and this mode collapse would be very easy for you guys to detect. How would you do this? You would take the generator, sample from the sample through the generator, so generate a bunch of images, and if they are all looking the same. Yeah, you kind of figure out that uh, that may not reflect the whole diversity of your data set. So if you always get, uh, not only always get, get a one uh, in the MNIST case, but really the same one, then you know you're in trouble. Okay. But, uh, yep. let, me, let me ask you a simple, maybe a very naive question. But suppose, um, I mean, you are generating, 
candidates for densities that are parameterized. So I, ca I can use other metrics. I can use, for instance, the Hellinger metrics. Mm -hmm. Metric. Yeah. So if you if you just add as a regularizing term the Hellinger distance to your whole loss function, yeah, that would not happen there. Yeah, and I, actually that's something um, that is a good direction to improve. Also in the sense of just knowing what's going on in the optimization. Because one thing in the optimization I like to look at is, for example, convergence plots. Now you have a settle fund problem. We know that we, what do we right. look at? This, this is but, what I was asking for this, all this machinery of primal doing splitting schemes, yeah. Yeah. Which, 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 which I think have one basic great idea. If the, the dual variable is approaching sort of the dual objective from below and the other one, the primal objective from above, so if things go ideally the gap between the two gives you acting gives you acting idea of where you yep. stand with your optimization yes but that mostly is for convex problems right or convex that concave is, that is that is true that uh, that, that is true. so I mean, that, that is um, yes that is, but that very is... often look i mean what about you have a convex the outer objective is often convex, like a yeah. mean square objective is convex. Now you are not convex because you're using a nonlinear parameterization, but you are you are trying to catch up with an with an overall. Sure. You see, I'm so I'm not. Uh, yeah. I, I, so um, I think this maybe isn't being exploited enough. Yes. That I would agree to. Um, so for, I mean, there are many ideas, I think, that still, that's why, you know, I'm teaching this class and I like, I mean, really like, uh, you know, this, this topic, because I think there are many uh, ways that we, uh, as, you know, applied computational math people or whatever hat we are, we have on can contribute, because um, there are still huge challenges I see in, in GANs. It's not like they work out of the box. Right. It's quite the opposite. Okay, so let's go back to, to mode collapse for, for this. So we all agree that this is a very irrelevant case where no, this is not a real problem because you can look at your generated images and, and you can find you out something find is wrong and you try again. I want to flip this example to make it a bit more interesting. So think about this. So what would happen if G mapped almost no Z to X1? Well, th then you just miss one point. You are just what missing. are the others doing? <laughs> yeah, you, exactly. So the, you know, say the other ones are perfect. So then you can look at it in two ways, a glass half empty, glass, glass half full kind of way. So you're not doing a perfect job because you're missing this one data set. Or this one, sorry, this one, one example. But it would be impossible for you to find out. So, um, think about having many examples, um, and then you know you sample from the generator. So maybe you just need to be more patient. You will never really detect that this is a mode collapse. And now these are the, the two extremes, of course. Um, but um, you know, for a science for a science problem where you have probably not just digits between zero and one, where you can think about. Uh, I mean, that's what people do. Then that they basically use a classifier. To find out, so if I sample a million images, like how many ones do I get, how many twos do I get, and so on, um, it's called inception score or something fancy in the end. But basically, to quantify this diversity of uh, the different classes in the game. But uh, for real problem, like uh, you could miss for complex distribution, you could could miss large parts of your data set without ever finding out, because uh, everyone here would be happy, like the discriminator would be happy, of course, the generator would be would, would, would be okay with the loss function. Even like uh, Wolfgang mentioned the Hellinger distance or other uh, two sample test problem ideas, it would be very, you'd need very good test statistics to find these cases if they, if they are rare. And, um, um, and you know, may not be, may not be important if your goal is to generate cat images and dog images and you miss one breed of cat or dog, no one is going to sue you. 
but if you're using this for anything serious, then um, then that's that. Yeah. Can if be, you use it in driving, this one might get you into the wall. Yeah, exactly. If you if you try to generate test cases for an autonomous driving vehicle, you know maybe maybe you're in trouble more. Um, yeah, so that is really difficult to detect and avoid, um, and there are heuristics at best uh, that you can look into, into uh, for for these different things and. Um, um, but anyway, let's look at the bright side. You have another notebook to play with at some point. There's a weekend coming up, I heard. Um, and that can generate images like so. I, you know, look, I, I mean, I didn't kill myself in making the best uh, example possible. Maybe if one of you can improve on this, um, you can do this. But one characteristic feature I see is that if I now cherry pick, I can actually see some pretty good images in there that are having kind of the same visual feel. And um, in some sense, it's always kind of, I'm a bit skeptical sometimes when I read these Gantt papers and see these great new celebrity <laughs> faces. And uh, a question I, I honestly have is like, okay, is this really when I download the code um, that I would get them all the time? Or is that um, a two-stage process where you generate a bunch and then you have a human uh, selecting them? But that's a different story, and I don't want to get, get into really uh, difficult debates here with anyone. Uh, I don't know. Definitely don't want to offend anyone. Uh, but uh, like compared to the VAE, I think you know you can you can see that the contrast here is much more realistic, and uh, and there are a few pretty good images in, in there. Again, and that's with random initialization. I think I did a bit better with the VAE initialization that I hinted at. So I trained the VAE first, and then I use it to initialize um, the GAN training. Um, typically, it was more stable. Um, and yeah, that's uh, what's called the DC GAN, uh, deep convolutional GAN. A pretty old paper by machine learning standards, probably two, three, four years old, um, so <laughs> ancient. Um, and yes, you can do better probably by now. If you have thoughts about this, I'm happy to chat. But uh, this is, this is a basic idea. Um, so the other very popular um, work in this area that I find intriguing, of course, because of the theory, is the Wasserstein gun. Um, so there, what you what you do is not discriminate between the two distributions, but to say uh, measure the transport cost um, in the high dimension space. Um, uh, between them, and the way to do this, I mean, Wu Chen is here. Is everyone preconditioned by Wu Chen? We discussed what? regularly, so we are also. Okay. So you're all, you're all preconditioned by Wuchen. Oh, yeah, he, and he's actually right. here. Great to see you again. <laughs> um, so then, you know, I, I'm not going to kill you with with a, with a big story, but basically, what you try to do is you try to find a transport plan between uh, the two distributions, and then quantify in some way how much um, you you pay for for the, for moving the mass. In this case, you just have uh, the standard norm, so that would me make it an earth mover distance. That's what everyone is doing. And that would define a, a distance function between the two distributions that you have. Um, the nasty part is that in order to find the distance function, it's not like a least squares that you can compute right away, but you have another minimization problem over all the possible ways of, of transporting the mass. OK, you by now know my, my fallback when I can't solve a problem. I say, well, um, let's just throw another neural network in. And that's exactly what, what will happen. So first you reformulate this um, uh, into this, um, has a fancy way of uh, Kantorovich Rubinstein dual or something like that. You can look it up in Perret's book or in some references. Um, you can uh, reformulate this same problem uh, by, minim by maximizing over a function that we'll call f. So that will be our discriminator, um, so to say. And it almost looks similar to the one that we had before. So you want f to be, uh, what is it, uh, large on the fake images and small on the true images. Okay, so um, and you have a constraint here that f has to be um, it's a function with Lipschitz one or or less. That's a, that's a big constraint. And again, it's then almost, you do, yeah. almost like total variation where you have less constraints. Yes, um, it's similar to to yes, yeah, it's similar to that. And in, in in many respects, I think if you plotted it, it would actually look like a like a TV reconstruction uh, almost if you if you did this in two D. And of course, you know now the idea is um, this guy here. We're not going to solve it exactly. Um, we're using another neural network which has a different set of weights. And it's again a scalar function, scalar valued function. You know, uh, last, but 
what, what concerns me right here is yeah. this. I mean, this is all very important for high dimensional problems, right? Yes. Lipschitz in high dimensions is a, is a huge set. I mean, to sort of find the right guy in that you, you expect to be fully subject to the curse of dimensionality. Um, it, but do you expect, that, is you, people, are people concerned by this or do they, so you, so you, or do they give a damn shit? Uh, depends, I think, who you ask. <laughs> um, look, um, I'm not saying it's easy to find this F. That's definitely not what I'm. And also, if you think about my 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 character, my my small picture that I had, you are really comparing the difficult distributions. So the VA, VAE actually, in that sense, is superior, I would say, because um, yeah, you compare the Gaussianity of the of the posterior distributions that you have. But these are supposed to be small dimensional and nice because one of them is a Gaussian. So here now you have all the exotic cases. You are, you are in high dimensions, which definitely makes computing OT I, just I mean, really, really conceptually, tricky. conceptually, this is superior, I say, be because, uh, be because in a way it is because it, it's, it's not so dependent on your dim dimensionalities. It can, it, 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 it can take all these topological changes in the distribution. It can, in a way, it can it can handle really in, on, on a re, it could on a rigorous level handle um, a wider scope of problems, but the realization maybe is yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, uh, you can always look at. I mean, you can easily get excited about this, and if you read this paper, which is the original paper of the Wasserstein and I mean, they have many many nice theoretical properties. Uh, think about mode collapse and all these things kind of going away, actually, in some sense, and also this vanishing gradient issues and and stuff like that. Um, but let's continue for a little bit and see what what we will think in five minutes. Um, okay, so here's a GAN training problem. It's again a saddle point problem, and now you also have this Lipschitz constraint. Mm -hmm. um, so there are theoretical advantages of the gen gener if the generator is continuous, then also is as uh, this part of the distance. If it's locally Lipschitz, you can actually compute. You actually have gradients, which is you know, something something great, and they are not exploding at any point or not vanishing at the wrong points. It seems in the theory. Um, practically, though. I have two concerns. So the first one is, I mean, how do you enforce this uh, constraint? Uh, you would be surprised uh, how simple you can do this or claim to do this. Um, the one that I have implemented in my code is you crop, uh, so cropping the weights, basically having bound constraints on the weights. There's absolutely no reason to believe that that would limit the Lipschitz constant. And definitely the rule of thumb is to never check the Lipschitz constant uh, because otherwise that would make you feel dizzy. Um, okay. But, but, but yeah, if you use a resonant structure, yes, I mean already limiting the nice uh, uh, limiting the norm of the of the increments would have a control on the Lipschitz curve. Oh, um, you know, and, uh, not too long ago, I, I worked very much on on resonant um, architectures and specifically on some that are non-expensive. So those are great candidates to, to try here in some sense. Okay. Um, the reason to the, that I have not tried them is first of all bandwidth, and the other uh, is a little bit of a lack of enthusiasm of getting into the GAN literature myself. Um, um, and also one more um, thing that I will say. So uh, by, by the way, so the rudimentary ways of of ensuring the Lipschitz constraint. Uh, the simple way is just to have bound constraints, but that's not going to be a good solution in general. Uh, the the bit more better, a bit better is a, a gradient penalty. Is, oh, that's uh, right. um, you can basically penalize it, but then you have to see in high dimensions measuring, you know, in high dimensions actually finding out the Lipschitz constant and then finding a good way to penalize it is it's another story. So it's all right. stochastic approximations like random directional derivatives that are penalized. But anyway, I, I've, I haven't tried that one. It was too complicated to implement. I wanted to give you a really, really simple code. Um, here's the disturbing part. So you may think that hard work pays off in, in this business. And there are like really good ways now with like C-Transform and other solvers, Wolfgang, that actually 
sort of beat the curse of dimensionality for these OT problems quite effectively. So they they are really effective methods to compute the w, w1 distance. All right. So this paper here by um, Carola Schindlibent and her group is really worth reading. Um, like if you have nothing going on on the weekend, I want you to read this paper um, in the sense that what they come and I've heard a few experiments like this in the past, but they were the first one I think writing them down is um, you may think that in order to get a good signal for your generator, you would do yourself a favor by actually computing the W1 distance, because that is what's giving you all the theoretical advantages over the, the other GANs. Um, so what they've compared in here is on, on quite a few data sets. Um, and they also have some theoretical arguments is that doing a great job there is actually not improving your results. Oops, uh, oops exactly. So, you know, the, the other approach that they have is based on C transforms. So basically, you know, you nail, you, say you nail the W1 distance here and your generator will become worse in the end. You will learn a worse generator. And that is really troubling news to me where also the enthusiasm of trying you know, to improve, to fix this uh, may not be the best uh, way to spend energy. But uh, be so before you kind of uh, yeah, get too excited about GANs, it's now my go-to paper I send everyone to. I, I have actually a question on this yes. point. Um, oh, yeah. You say training F more accurately may not improve results, but are there examples where that is true no matter what your initial guess is for the generator? That I don't know. <laughs> Um, that is, of course, a great question because, in the end of the day, we can only find uh, local solutions to all these these but, problems, and it may but, be that uh, you may need to yeah. tighten it along the way. But it's but, definitely a counterintuitive point for me um, that uh, doing for many examples doing better on this one part does not mean doing better of, overall because that's literally the kind of one of the sales pitches in the theory that the, the most of, most of the theoretical results are based. On having the W1 distance. But uh, yeah. Hans, let, let me tell you, how do you check whether you you found your near maximizer that realizes the W1 distance? How do you check that? Because um, if you make a mistake there, the explanation, if if say your your adversarial network is not rich enough to, to do that job then you may make a mistake and, and, and see a bad, a bad generator simply because you, you didn't train the generator on the right metric. Right? Sure, sure. sure. But, that but, would show in the, in the signal quality for sure. Yes. So, um, so the question to me always in, in all this gun business, the question to me is whether your adversarial guy is rich enough. Yes. Because that's, that's in the end determines everything. Right. That's that's what I used to believe as well. Um, um, read fifteen, um, and because basically what they are doing there is they use a very very powerful and uh, there are optimality conditions. After all, computing the W one distance is a convex problem, so you can do it in you know, not maybe the most efficient way, but you can actually check optimality conditions for these type of problems, um, uh, or at least approximate heuristic ones. I, I, I... okay. Um, but but anyway, so um, you in this case at least they use a way more powerful discriminator. It's way closer to reality, let's say, to the real W one distance, and they show that the, the generators learned are not as good as the ones they obtain for doing a poorer job in there. And it may be because you're still having a settle point problem, and as Gabe said, maybe you know. Is you, it is it maybe? Oh, oh, you're saying for the same architecture of the generator, another yes. method did better for the same architecture. Yes, I mean, the generator typically, um, you know, also in my examples here, I'm always using the same generator. I'm just you know training it with ah, the VAE yeah. ones, with the W GAN, yeah. with the BC GAN, I just see. changing the other the other role here. Um, and anyway, you know, maybe also, it's, of course, it's a paper that came out like a few weeks ago. It's not peer reviewed. Maybe other things are going on. No, but really it's um, but it is a very interesting result. I think that we should try to understand a bit better. This, this Wasserstein one, would you get the same for Wasserstein two? Because uh, I would feel a little more, I would feel actually a little more comfortable with it because me, then me you too. Hilbert space set. Yes, me too. 
um, but that is for Wuchen to answer. Um, ah, that's for Wuchen. So, I will ask. Yeah, yeah, it's above my pay grade. Like for that, we need Wuchen. Um, okay, so anyway, you get nice images. I cannot say they look better than the, the DC GAN. Um, there is actually also another paper, it's referenced in 15, that uh, says basically that the uh, discriminator almost doesn't matter. It's just a matter of how much time and GPU money you spend on tuning hyperparameters. Um, that's another controversial paper in this area. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, another fun read. Um, so it, as you say, I mean, or maybe you feel this, that my, my course becomes way less rigorous the longer I move along. And um, maybe my enthusiasm also goes down. And that's not because I'm tired of, of you or tired of the material, but it's also, I mean, in this business, um, I don't know. I want the, the dust to be settled at some point and to see what, what will survive in terms of the ideas. Anyway, and also here, uh, you can initialize with the VAE. And in terms of, so I use it, I oh, know I don't have the picture here. So in the code, when you run it, um, I use another two sample test statistics so that during the iterations, I can kind of quantify how well the images sort of are, how similar the distributions are. Um, the reason uh, to look back to Wolfgang's question, um, why not just train on, the, on these sort of distances? Typically, the biggest part is that you need to get an unbiased gradient estimate. And with many of these distances, like Hellinger distance and other ones, uh, the naive gradient you would get by using a batch here and a batch there would be either too noisy or oftentimes uh, um, biased. So that way, you know, it's, a, it's an important consideration to get, get these things to work. Um, the descent in the parameter space is the not corresponding well to the descent in your real geometry. Uh, yeah, so I mean, basically, what you need here, in, from the organization point of view, is you want each step to minimize the expected loss, yeah. and for that to go through uh, theoretically, you need an unbiased estimate. And it can be noisy; it's okay, but it has to be unbiased from the from the true gradient of the expected loss. And right. that is all typically typically the problem with with some of these distances. Although there are distances, I think one is called MMD gun, and um, there's a big zoo of of ideas and and examples, of course, out there. Okay, great. Uh, we are one minute away from our yeah. terminal yeah. condition, so let's uh, summarize. Uh, we have seen three approaches. Here they are. Um, hopefully, this slide now makes a bit more sense. It's stolen from the very beginning. Um, I would really claim we went from easy to more difficult in the sense mm -hmm. that um, things became way more messy the longer we were on this call. And um, also probably much more interesting from a research perspective, but also kind of, we have to kind of, we, we have to pick our fights these days and we have to kind of see which, uh, how now you can improve uh, things in this business, I think will be a, a combination. And that's what you see in the literature, a combination of these core ideas. And to master them, or at least have a good understanding of them, uh, has been my objective. And uh, hopefully, I got a little bit closer with respect to that. And I, I mean, I certainly enjoyed all the discussions we had on, on all these aspects. So maybe a quick comparison. Um, so the first class of algorithms, I mean, they are nice because they, you can compute the and optimize directly the likelihood, and that simplifies a ton of problems. You only have one network, basically. Um, you implicitly minimize the distance in the latent space also. That's also a good thing because in the end of the day, that's what you are going to uh, use in the sampling. Uh, the core disadvantages, or minus means that it's not good, um, is you need smoothness and you definitely need the equal, dis the equal dimensionality of, of Q and, D and uh, N. And also they have to be, um, the intrinsic dimensionality have to be the same. Uh, that is hard to check. Um, basically, you only do trial and error. If you uh, let's say one suggested example for this moons example, you can control the width of the moons, and you can see if you make them wider, it'll be much easier to train the generator, and if you make them narrower, things will not behave so well, as you as you should uh, realize from the theory. So VAEs, um, the generator can be more flexible. You have still a relation between the loss and the likelihood, and I personally like that. I mean, at least um, it makes me feel better that I had not optimizing something completely crazy. And it's a minimization problem, so it's easier in, in many respects. Um, but um, yeah, uh, you cannot so easily compute uh, the likelihood. I mean, you have to have this high dimension integral. 
Um, and the biggest drawback I see is um, since the, depending on the richness of the encoders, you will not sample the relevant parts. So it's kind of um, the generalization aspect here becomes way more difficult. Whereas in GANs, you fix that because you optimize directly on the, on the samples that you're using later on, which is to me then no surprise that if you do a great job that you will, you will see better images there. But there's mode collapse, at least for um, the DC GAN, you need to really deal with the, with the difficult animal here, uh, high dimensional complex distributions and you have saddle point problems. So the hyperparameters here to make things work and the money you need to spend on the cloud for serious GPUs is, is, uh, can be quite, quite high, quite easily. Um, so yeah, there's of course, probably I think now consensus would be the big push toward GAN type ideas, but um, yeah, uh, they are not so easy. And um, probably in my course, I have a good opportunity to be honest with you about these uh, experiences that, that I've made also because I'm not so committed to any of these uh, three worlds. But the, from the result perspective, oftentimes uh, they have been observed to give good results. So it's worth um, you know, doing, getting more understanding. And that's probably the most important takeaway. Uh, it's very likely, um, and I try to be, uh, you know, cautious here. I just say likely. It's, it's probably sure that uh, deep generative modeling will be will remain a really active uh, research topic for the next years. I don't, I didn't check, but at some point before writing our paper, Eldad um, and I did a rough estimate of how many papers on on generative models are published in a given year, and the estimate was in the hundreds. So that's where we said let's not really try to do a lit, lit review or anything um, because that's no point in keeping up. Like drinking out of a fire horse, uh, house, but they're, they're definitely more open problems. So here are a few. Um, the, the core problem really uh, I try to emphasize is how do you compare the distributions? And uh, that problem is not new. So there are ideas from high dimension statistics. I mean, Wolfgang already mentioned a few and, and I mentioned another one or I have another one in the code. Um, so maybe there are still hidden hidden treasures that we can, that we can look into. Um, the important part is deep generative modeling is really an input problem because you cannot uniquely, inf I mean, for sure not uniquely infer the true distribution based on a bunch of samples. And uh, probably if, even if you can, then uh, that may not be a stable thing, stable process. So there are limitations and there's for all the input problems, it's about getting all the mechanics right. Um, think about the neural network design, objective function, regularization, optimization, the, these all have to be sorted out and they will really dictate how well you're doing. Uh, I wish there would be more guidelines for choosing, for example, latent distribution. I think we talked about that because uh, we stick, uh, stick to a Gaussian here, but clearly if you know something about your data, you would probably do better if you uh, know it's a mixture or it's kind of, I don't know, X, Y, Z. Um, and, and yeah, the efficiency of the training algorithms, I think still is an open, is an open issue because um, these things become expensive uh, quite quickly. And these days expensiveness, uh, makes actually kind of a nice, a nice thing about cloud computing, expensiveness can really translate to dollars of your advisor's research account quite quickly. So um, doing, doing better here or CO2, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you care about that, uh, it's also a big problem with GPUs in particular. Uh, they have a huge CO2 footprint um, and uh, doing, doing better there with, with math and some theory and algorithms would be really high on my wish list. And maybe one of you can solve some of these problems. And yeah, with that, you know, I would really want to thank uh, Wolfgang and Wuchan and Peter and who else was involved in, in organizing this program. And most importantly, everyone here to show up and, and stay very late on a, on a Friday afternoon and, uh, and chat with me about these topics. And uh, if you have more things that come up later, um, you know how to find me. And I'm always happy to chat. Thank you very much, Lars. That was very inspiring. Cool. Thank yeah. you. I, think I, I enjoyed that a lot. And hopefully for the others as well. Yeah, me too. I had a good time. So. Yeah, I mean, I have a few more minutes, maybe if there are really burning questions or so. Um, and uh... yeah, we can when briefly chat. Peter and I, we have a we have a cap. We have an appointment somewhat later, yeah. so we can't go forever. But um, let's just stay yeah. on for a couple of minutes because it was really, really nice. I enjoyed that a lot. 
any anybody from the audience to chime in. For instance, Chun Yang is usually courageous enough to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I spotted her. Oh, Olga, you are you, you, you are still up. Yes, <laughs> still here. Good. It was really interesting, Lars. Uh, okay. Great overview. Yeah, I hope it was uh, not was, too boring. No, that's uh, the reason why I could stay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I'm a good test. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, actually having the same question that uh, Wolfgang asked at some point, why really insisting on working with the uh, Wasserstein one instead of the two, uh, which uh, is maybe easier to compute? Yeah, Wu -Chen it's, 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 a, it's a Wu Chen question. Um, so so, so where is Wu Chen? <laughs> so I, I'm not I'm not committed in this business. You know, in the end of the day, if you get better images out of the W two, that's what you should publish. Um, and uh, I would agree, it's probably easier to do that. Yeah, but, well, that's uh, a, let's see what Wu Chen thinks. Yeah, for for like a like a while too, like you, you met tomorrow, like a Stanley Archer, he will talk about a generalization of all this. Mindful or even more general energy. It's all computable. Yeah. See, that's the other answer I was hoping for. So probably Wu Chen has already three papers on this. Yeah, well, this is like, you know, this is, uh, you know, Western one somehow is very like a TV like, but it's TV in the mapping space. So that's mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. like it a uh, while. But for Western two is more like, you know, something like uh, uh, L2 details in the mapping space. So yeah, that's... which is which is way easier to deal with and actually quite powerful. Yeah. Don't tell Stan I said this, but that's um but you have to deal but with Wasserstein too, you have to deal with Laplacians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. On, on on maybe crazy manifolds. Exactly. Exactly. So so for for so Western P not only one or two, you can do Western P, like you choose different power for this. Uh, it's very like a classical way of uh, you know uh, what's the way called the lasso of stuff, right? You have P mm -hmm. but this is, uh, but the P equals one is TV like, but for P equals two is more like L two depends. Now, if you put it into the network like largely taught, then you will have uh, originally you have some Laplace operator depend on power of P, but now it become more crazy because of this mapping function involved. So it's uh, uh, very interesting. So, do you think that uh, using the W one is uh, related to explaining? why the images are eventually a bit sharper the corners are uh, less blurred it, 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 has, it has a relation so if you write it into a mapping i mean if you can see the very simple model then you can exactly write some problem like uh, you know like a classical collaboration case which allows you to see why it is good but still create your you know this is like you 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 consider the other in the mapping space you want to write down some objective function, and uh, which objective function will give you the classical way of this old uh, mm -hmm. classical loss function. Yeah. So it's not a uh, this is not a simple task, but for simple model you can always you know give uh, some understanding. Uh, but but Wu Chen, uh, since I have you, have yeah. you read have you read Carola's paper? Which which one? The... Uh, so this one here, fifteen. Oh yes, uh, I haven't. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a new paper. <laughs> yeah. Look look at the title. Um, okay. And and um, again, I'm if you if you ever want, I mean, now that let's let's look at the nice uh, the, the only good thing coming out of the pandemic is yeah. we are way closer together because if you if you want to. If you read it and you want to chat, uh, I would be up for this. That would be actually quite interesting to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I see. Because that's a paper, oh. you know, Wolf, Wolfgang, that's yeah. the one I mentioned uh, yeah. when, when we talked about this, that doing better doesn't always uh, doesn't always really pay off. And, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I agree. You know, if you really care about it, to get something, to find, compute it accurately somehow, always it's harder, you know. Some, but, uh, but if you suppose we compute it accurately, it should work. Okay, that, that is the, the, the yeah, important. and that's uh, see. Uh, I don't know how, how Wolfgang feels about this, but for people like from computational science and engineering community or from yeah, yeah. computational math, 
we we are okay with working harder to get a get a more accurate solution i think that's we have shown that we can be quite yeah, persistent yeah, yeah. on that yeah, yeah. but at least we would want to get a better solution out of all this hard work and um, that's, that's, that's very correct and if we get a worse solution for more work that's yeah. not making us very happy yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, it's, that's, it's telling you something about the problem then that's yeah. right. our, our job in say computational mathematics is ultimately to move towards predictive capabilities, yes. prediction capabilities. And that means you have to be able to assess in one way or the other in a, in a certifiable way accuracy. Yeah. And, uh, and that is a, a slightly different game than what's being done in most, air, in, in, in most parts of the, of the community. Right, yes. because they are content with inspecting results and like it on dislike. Yeah, I mean, so, like I told you, like for this, um, yeah, for these samples that I have, they are great if you delete um, sixty yeah. percent of the images. Um, yeah, so, and, um, but I think that's really the kind of the. But, break of, of, but the price is the price is that you can't really pinpoint very often where your whole yeah. method fails because. Yeah these things tend to be very intricate. I mean, there are lots yeah. of constituents going into the game and, 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 your, and your failure may have maybe even a combination of different things yeah. that don't work together, right? Yeah, that's for exactly what's making the training so costly. For, for instance, uh, when, when you, fix, you, you fix the architecture of the generator, yeah. now you take one scheme to, to train, you find some combination of your hyperparameters. Now, if you take another another scheme to train, um, you may up in a different area, right? Yeah, let's not talk about a different scheme. Let's just think about sampling your training data in a different order. All right, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's hypersensitive. All that and that's, that's um, really also what, what I really would encourage you guys to do, to check out these few notebooks that I have. Um, yeah. if, you're, if you're interested, especially the students here and uh, maybe postdocs or whoever typically has more time, but also it's more important, I think, to, to really get your hands dirty and, and you look under the hood and to see the robustness to the hyperparameters. So the GAN examples here, that, was, that cost me the most amount of time to get this done. And it was on a data set where generations of graduate students have uh, worked on published uh, notebooks and examples online. But what I wanted, I had the ambition of using really the exact same generator for the whole, for the whole course. That's why I needed to then slight change, you know, remove a batch norm here or put another batch norm in, in there. Complete change of uh, batch sizes, learning rates, uh, whatever I needed to pick. And uh, and, and that is really kind of um, disturbing. Yeah, it's, it's not good news. Um, so, so now, Wolfgang, no. that's why I avoided your question in the beginning about GAN. Because um, uh, in, in some sense, I mean, yes, you know, we can bash VAEs uh, for, for, for many of the uh, not so nice theoretical properties, or at least the implementation probably. It was more an implementation issue that I had to use a very simple posterior, and therefore, you know, all the bounds were not so tight. But, uh, but overall, um, the, my experience there has been still a, a bit more pleasant than, than in this world where you're, where you're flying blind, if we are, if we are honest. I see. You need, you need another layer of learning your code stipulation. You know, what it says, uh, there's a, believe it or not, there are papers they are called learn, learn to Learn or something yeah, like it's, that. Um, it's very natural. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, anyway, um, kind of, yeah, that's, um, you know, my view of things, um, it's, um, yeah. probably yeah. Co contra so I, can, I couldn't give this talk in a machine learning conference um, without being stoned, I think, at the You're end. You're kidding. Yeah. Yeah, that militant about their beliefs, amazing. I don't know if, uh, is that a surprise to anyone? Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, but, but uh, as I said, I mean, I also try to be uh, open-minded about these scans. Yeah. Uh, there, there may be some use cases with better tools, with better maybe some theory that we can do here um, to really get these things working because they are not working. Even trial, though I think this trial and error approach is not good. I think and, and they are and I will say also so there are really impressive results with guns that have been achieved and so there is not impossible to train them. Um, 
so the, I've, uh, one, when I was at IPEM, there was actually we had a panel discussion on deep fakes and impact on society and so on, and also technology. And there were there was one company over, uh, present over there. They were amazing. So you could speak two sentences um, into a, into a microphone and get an, a voice emulator for yourself. So you can type something and uh, you can basically on the phone you can sort of chat and it's. Um, it's amazing they could make this work, and uh, of course uh, you can you know, feel uh, have mixed feelings about this. But one use case, for example, is for people who, kind of due to cancer treatment or so, lose their voice. They can preserve their voice. I mean, it's an amazing thing, and it's gone based. And um, apparently, these guys, uh, out of a bachelor's uh, project, uh, have have been able to figure this out. But let me ask you, um, these big successes of GAN, are they restricted to classification? Or are they, uh, do they include, no. do they in, in include regression type? Um, so regression, you mean, um, you mean uh, yeah, the you, DC you, gun? Learn, you learn functions. I mean, you do not say, um, you have a continuous range, not just a, a finite number. Okay, okay. So or you, where you land in, it's different. So your, your first description, uh, Doing this uh, this min max problem on the yeah. divergence. This is was for classification, right? Um, not for classification because it is an unsupervised learning setting, so you don't have labels of your ah, images. Yeah, yeah. You, but yeah. you use classification to find uh, to discriminate uh, how well you're doing. Yeah, I, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got that wrong. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay, lots more to to find out for us. And again, uh, happy to have another call at some point um, if, if you guys are interested. Uh, and um... yeah, I, I think maybe when, when things turn back to normal somewhat. Sure. We could have uh, meeting face to face. That will, I don't know how that yep. even yep. Is, uh, is feeling anymore like after such a long time, but that will be, of course, a, a great thing. And also, I mean, just the standing invitation, like, you know, Atlanta is a big airport. Uh, if you happen to stop by, uh, Emory is only 20 minutes from the airport. Um, so it's um, always always good to visit. And we have a lot of activity coming up here. So uh, we have a new NSF REU site for computational math and data science um, that I'm PIing. And we have an RTG also, like a research training group uh, that Jim Nagy is, is, is PIing. Um, so there are lot, tons and tons of opportunities to um, you know, send us people or come yourself well, for, for some looking, activity. We're looking ourselves because we also got an RTG. Oh, congrats. So great. Um, I mean, that's really good to hear because uh, this, yeah. uh, this area, I think, deserves much more, much more attention. So, yeah, maybe we can trade uh, people at some point. It's, um, that's right. we, we do, we're I mean, still waiting for the official and then we, we hopefully have an add out pretty soon. A good network is always good. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Very so good, then uh, let's call it a day. I enjoyed yes. it very much. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Thanks for the opportunity and um, thanks for organizing the school. I tried to go to Stan's talk over the weekend, but uh, do, that's always the plan. And then we'll see how the weekend evolves. Um, anyway, enjoy the rest of the of the spring school. I hope to catch you in person yeah. at some point. Okay. Take care. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.